Well, I grew up in a family that lived in trees. I, um, I grew up in British Columbia, which is forested. Um, my families grew from grew up in the sort of the interior rainforests. My um, grandparents were loggers <laughs> um, and ranchers, and so I have it in my blood. Um, so there, there's that, but also I, I, I'm just one of those people who who is really connected to the, to the earth. I think that because I'm so spiritually connected to the forest from my family, my history, whatever came before me, <laughs> um, it, 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 it's something that's very natural in me and I get a great deal of pleasure and healing from the forest and, and a great deal of knowledge. You know, I, 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 I learn all the time when I go, go into the forest. So. It's just a natural place for me. I love it. I spend my life looking after it as best as I can. Yes, trees are the foundation of forests. But a forest is much more than what you see. And today, I want to change the way you think about forests. You see, underground, there is this other world, a world of infinite biological pathways that connect trees and allow them to communicate and allow the forest to behave as though it's a single organism. It might remind you of a sort of intelligence. We all know that trees have roots, and those roots um, comprise anywhere from half to three quarters of the biomass of a tree. So, you know, what we see above ground is really just a small part. And the roots um, have lots of functions. One of the things I study are what are called mycorrhizal fungi. And they form this mutualistic symbiosis with tree roots, and um, they trade. The, the tree and the fungus trade. The tree provides carbon, and in return, the fungus will grow through the soil and access nutrients and water and bring it back to the tree. And so they both benefit. All of the trees are mycorrhizal. They all depend on these mycorrhizae in this mutualistic partnership to survive and grow. Eventually, I realized that that pallet of roots and soil was really the foundation of the forest. And I wanted to know more. You see, scientists had just discovered in the laboratory that one pine seedling root could transmit carbon to another pine seedling root. But this was in the laboratory, and I wondered, could this happen in real forests? I thought, yes. Trees in real forests might also share information below ground. But this was really controversial, and some people thought I was crazy. If you were to look in the soil and look at the fungal network, it's huge, right? There's massive amounts of fungi. And so when a, when a seedling starts to grow, um, it would be very difficult for it not to hook into that fungal network. The first day of the experiment, we got out to our plot, and a grizzly bear and her cub chased us off. <laughs> and I had no bear spray. But you know, this is how forest research in Canada goes. <laughs> so we came back the next day, and Mama Grizzly and her cub were gone. So this time, we really got started. And I pulled on my white paper suit, I put on my respirator, and then I put the plastic bags over my trees. I got my giant syringes, and I injected the bags with my tracer isotope carbon dioxide gases. First, the birch. I injected carbon-14, the radioactive gas, into the bag of birch. And then for fir, I injected the stable isotope, carbon-13, carbon dioxide gas. I used two isotopes, because I was wondering whether there was two-way communication going on between these species. I got to the final bag, the 80th replica, and all of a sudden, Mama Grizzly showed up again. And she started to chase me, and I had my syringes above my head, and I was swatting the mosquitoes, and I jumped into the truck, and I thought, this is why people do lab studies. <laughs> I waited an hour. I figured it would take this long for the trees to suck up the CO2 through photosynthesis, turn it into sugars, send it down into their roots, and maybe, I hypothesized, shuttle that carbon below ground to their neighbors. After the hour was up, I rolled down my window, and I checked for Mama Grizzly. Oh, good, she's over there eating her huckleberries. So I got out of the truck, and I got to work. 
I went to my first bag with the birch. I pulled the bag off. I ran my Geiger counter over its leaves. <sighs> Perfect. The birch had taken up the radioactive gas. Then the moment of truth. I went over to the fir tree. I pulled off its bag. I ran the Geiger counter up its needles, and I heard the most beautiful sound. <sighs> It was the sound of birch talking to fir, and birch was saying, "Hey, can I help you?" And fir was saying, "Yeah, can you send me some of your carbon? 'Cause somebody threw a shake cloth over me." We don't know exactly what molecules are moving from tree to tree through the mycorrhizal network, but we have some good hunches. We know that there's a lot of nitrogen that moves with the carbon as well, and so we we think, based on our studies, that it's actually amino acids that are moving through the fungal network from tree to tree, or yeah, simple amino acids or simple proteins. So now I want to talk about the science. How were paper birch and Douglas fir communicating? Well, it turns out they were conversing not only in the language of carbon, but also nitrogen and phosphorus and water and defense signals and allele chemicals and hormones, information. And at that moment, everything came into focus for me. I knew I'd found something big, something that would change the way we look at how trees interact in forests, from not just competitors, but to cooperators. And I had found solid evidence of this massive below-ground communications network, the other world. So it becomes this net, this major web or community of organisms that are working with the tree to create this beautiful forest function and structure. And that complexity actually results in, uh, you know, a more resilient community.